to see all these beautiful smiling faces and even some of the not so beautiful faces. Um, great to have all of you here this morning. Go ahead and grab the hymnal and turn to hymn number, let's try 243. We're going to stand and sing victory in Jesus. Hymn number 243. Yes, once you find it, go ahead and stand up. Yeah. Two, four. Looks like we all got it, so let's go ahead and sing Victory in Jesus. I heard an old, old story How my Savior came from glory How he gave his life on Calvary to save a wretch like me I heard about his groaning Of his precious blood's atoning Then I repented of my sins And I won my victory Oh, victory in Jesus my Savior forever. He sought me and he bought me with his redeeming blood. He loved me ere I knew him and all my love is due him. He plunged me to victory beneath the cleansing flood. I heard about his healing, of his cleansing power revealing, how he made the lame to walk again, and caused the blind to see. And then I cried, dear Jesus, Come and heal my broken spirit. And somehow Jesus came and brought my victory. Oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. He sought me and he bought me with his redeeming blood. He loved me ere I knew him, and all my love is due him. He plunged me to victory beneath the cleansing flood. I heard about a mansion he has built for me in glory. And I heard about them streets of gold beyond the crystal sea. About the angels singing and the old redemption story. And some sweet day I'll sing up there my song of victory. Oh, victory in Jesus my Savior forever. He sought me and he bought me with his redeeming blood. He loved me ere I knew him and all my love is due him. He plunged me to victory beneath the cleansing flood. Amen. Does anyone here have victory in Jesus? Amen. I tell you what, a blessing. Amen. It's, it's an incredible thought when we think about such love that Jesus had for us. And since we're talking about such love, why don't we go ahead and turn to hymn number 179 and let's sing such love. That's hymn 179. Does anyone here know this song besides me and the, the pianist? Really? I think you'll recognize it once we get started. I love teaching y'all new songs. It's so much fun standing up here singing all by my lonesome. So if you do know it, sing it out for Jesus this morning. Hymn number 179, Such Love. Mm -hmm. 
<laughs> Maybe we won't. That God should love a sinner such as I Should yearn to change my sorrow into bliss Nor rest till he had planned to bring me nigh How wonderful is love like this Such love, such wondrous love Such love, such wondrous love that God should love a sinner such as I. How wonderful is love like this. Now, does anybody recognize the song at least? Still a bunch of blank stares. Pastor, you know this song, right? Amen? Well, oh, I got one up top. Hey, amen, Brother Mark. Thank you. Oh, yeah, he can't even sing. So that doesn't help a whole lot. Well, now you're getting a little bit of idea how this song goes. But, again, such love. Even if we don't know that that well, we know such love. Amen? So let's sing it loud for Jesus anyway. You know, God doesn't say sing pretty. He said make a joyful noise. And, and from up here, I can tell you it's a noise. So let's sing some more on verse. We'll go ahead and just jump to verse 4. This is going to be torture up here. But let's sing verse 4. And now he takes me to his heart. Son. Amen? Do the uh, intro. And now he takes me to his heart, a son. He asks me not to fill a servant's place. The far off country wanderings all are done. Wide open are his arms of grace. Such love, such wondrous love. Such love, such wondrous love. That God should love a sinner such as I. How wonderful is love like this. Amen. That was good noise. <laughs> Very rarely do I get a song that I don't know and that was one of them I'm sure I've heard it somewhere along the uh, 40 plus years that I've been saved but I never sung it before and so I'll tell you there's awesome songs out there that we never sing there's a lot of them in the hymn book we've never sung so anyway all right let's bow for prayer father we thank you this morning for your blessings we pray especially this morning for Israel Lord the uh, 70 nations are meeting, including the United States, uh, to force uh, uh, Israel to a, uh, a divided state and uh, give their land, Lord, to the Palestinians. Uh, uh, Lord, we know that you gave Israel this land. Uh, if they do not have all of the land, Lord, that you've given them, uh, but Jerusalem and uh, Israel and, uh, Lord, the other, uh, just the smaller areas around. Uh, but, Lord, I just pray that you would, uh, uh, Lord, uh, intervene on their behalf as I know you will uh, Lord that you would uh, uh, Lord make sure that uh, uh, they are not uh, forced into uh, doing something that's against your will and Lord I pray for America Lord as we uh, are are siding against Israel the first time uh, since uh, America has uh, and Israel have been uh, uh, aligned together allied together uh, that we've had a president that uh, is bent on uh, 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 siding with the Muslims and the Arabs uh, in this case. Lord, I just pray, uh, Lord, that you would uh, undertake on this behalf. And then, Heavenly Father, we pray this morning for uh, a number of folks that are out sick. Lord, 99% of my family is out, which is, a, is highly unusual. Uh, Lord, I just pray that you would touch bodies, heal them, raise them up. Lord, I know the, the weather has a major part as well as the time of year with the flu and uh, respiratory problems and all of that Lord I just pray for each and every one today that is uh, unable to be here because of the because of uh, sickness uh, Lord I just pray that you touch bodies Lord I pray this morning that uh, as we meet together with you uh, Lord that you would touch our hearts uh, Lord that we'd worship you in spirit and in truth we ask your blessings on Jesus in Jesus name amen thank you you may be seated <coughs> I'm not having a problem with my throat I didn't think <laughs> So anyway, Brother Gary is uh, has the flu. Uh, Miss Nan has respiratory. 
uh, Michael uh, uh, took him to the doctor on Tuesday. He was burning a fever. Uh, they gave him a Z-Pack. This is the third day, and he's still uh, uh, not any better. That's unusual with the Z-Pack. So um, I'll have to take him back to the doctor on Wednesday. Uh, but there's just so many people that are out. Miss Charlene's out today because uh, she's not well. And just uh, not a host of folks that are ill. Uh, and so be in prayer for each and every one. Just be in prayer for those of us uh, who have not fallen under the uh, illness that everybody else has uh, to um, uh, make it through. <laughs> uh, I don't wish this on anybody. Poor Mike. Uh, woke me up in the middle of the night coughing and hacking and and um, just couldn't get his breath and uh, so I went down and gave him some medicine and this morning the same thing so uh, and he he's got a, a cyst the size of a grapefruit in the right middle quadrant of his uh, uh, lung and uh, if it gets fluid in it then he's in the hospital and uh, so uh, and I kept telling the doctor that telling the doctor that and you know, he said, well, it doesn't, his lungs sound fairly good, you know, <laughs> but anyway, so uh, I'm hoping and praying that that's not filling up with fluid uh, because he's, he will be sick in the hospital. Uh, so anyway, be in prayer for him, if you will. Uh, I know that uh, everybody else is, that's ill is falling under all of the same thing. Uh, it's the weather. You know, we had, we had our, our winter. Uh, between January the 9th and January the 12th and uh, you know today this evening is supposed to be like an 80% chance of rain 100% tomorrow and you know either 80 or 100% on Tuesday and you know it just <laughs> it do, it's not conducive to staying well uh, so if you don't have to get out into it and all don't do it uh, you know keep your health the best that you can uh, I knew we'd be down today simply because of, of so many people that are ill uh, but do be in prayer for them. Just look at the bulletin. There's a couple things that are coming up. We have the uh, corrected dates in there. Uh, uh, you know, it's always the best to use the right calendar uh, when you're putting dates and things. Uh, but our uh, church fellowship will be on the 29th. That's the last Sunday of this month. And uh, you just bring, uh, you know, whatever you like, snacks, uh, soup, salads, uh, desserts, and things like that. And We'll play games and we'll, you know, just have a time of fellowship and all. Uh, or if you like to play games, you can play games. If you don't like to play games, you can fellowship and make fun of those that do like to play games. Because it gets kind of hilarious, you know. Especially they have that one that you, you know, I, I won't play it because I don't want to get stuff in my face. Uh, but, you know, that's, uh, what is it called? Uh, pie face? I mean, I watch people playing that, you know, and I'm going, yeah, that's not happening. Uh, so uh, if you like to play that game it's hilarious to watch them do it but uh, you know I, I don't want to be a party of it uh, and then you find out who in the church cheats and uh, you know it, I mean it's it's pretty good you know of course they claim they're not but you know anyway it's like uh, uh, I was watching a program one time and they were playing a card game I think like bridge or something like that and um, you know, one of the partners across the table was saying, you know, uh, I heard like the King of England was uh, 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 talking to his subjects and, uh, <laughs> you know, uh, and giving hints like that, you know. You know, I, I, I don't know anything about that kind of stuff. But anyway, don't cheat when you play the games. And then, of course, uh, uh, some other things that are going on. Read your bulletin and uh, we won't have to. Uh, hash it out again, all right? Again, thank you for being here this morning, Brother Roy. For those of you who actually do read the bulletin, I don't think we're having a fellow sip. I think it is actually fellowship. Go ahead and uh, grab the hymnals one more time and stand up and turn to hymn number 232. That's number 232. If the men will come forward on the third verse. We're going to sing, Tell Me the Story of Jesus, hymn number 232. Tell me the story of Jesus, 
write on my heart every word. Tell me the story most precious, sweetest that ever was heard. Tell how the angels in chorus sing as they welcomed his birth. Glory to God in the highest, peace and good tidings of earth. Tell me the story of Jesus, write on my heart every word. Tell me the story most precious, sweetest that ever was heard. Fasting alone in the desert, tell of the days that are past. How for our sins he was tempted, yet was triumphant at last. Tell of the years of his labor, tell of the sorrow he bore. He was despised and afflicted, homeless, rejected, and poor. Tell me the story of Jesus, write on my heart every word. Tell me the story most precious, sweetest that ever was heard. Tell of the cross where they nailed him, writhing in anguish and pain. Tell of the grave where they laid him, tell how he liveth again. Love in that story so tender, clearer than ever I see. Stay, let me weep while you whisper, Love paid the ransom for me. Tell me the story of Jesus, Write on my heart every word. Tell me the story most precious, Sweetest that ever was heard. Amen. Y'all, uh, don't let Mark, or Mark, or Roy, or whatever this guy's name is over here, um, uh, get on you too much about that song y'all didn't know, because y'all may not have noticed it, but on that last verse, see, I can tell Stan over there trying to hear, he was mumbling a lot, which means he didn't know it either. Uh, after church service, uh, good news, we are ready to really go forward in the new moves. So if you are interested in helping us in the new moves or want to find out more about it, right after church, we're going to have a meeting right over here uh, on y'all's left, my right, uh, and we'll go over it and you can uh, find out more about it and uh, pick up your packs and, and learn what to do. In the book of Joshua, chapter 1, verse 8, the Lord tells us, This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night, that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein. For then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and then thou shalt have good success. You all have heard me say many times that there's no such thing as luck. Stop saying luck. Luck is, is it doesn't exist. This morning I was watching a video, uh, one of those encouraging, you can do it type of videos, and I discovered I was wrong. There is such a thing as luck. But it's not the luck the world thinks is. Let me give you a definition of true luck. Laboring under correct knowledge. Luck. See, when you rely on the universe to help you, that's all random chaos. It's falling apart. But when you rely on truth, when you're working under truth, just as the verse we just read says, you will have good success. Promise from God. 
But you have to know what the Word says, what God says to do, in order to have that success. Now, you've got a great first step coming here this morning. You'll have even better if you come back tonight and Wednesday night. And you'll go even further if every night you start studying the Word of God or continue to study the Word of God. And then you'll go even further when you're praying for wisdom on those things you're doing. Now, as we receive the offering this morning, remember that that is a command from the Lord. That if you don't tithe, give 10%, God says you're stealing from Him. That's not my words, that's His. I don't judge you, that's God's responsibility. But you have to judge yourself first. So as we receive the offering, give that 10% with a joyful heart because the Lord loves a cheerful giver. And uh, we're glad to see that Jason's back from his safari, and we're going to uh, ask him to lead us in prayer this morning. Let's pray. Father, we first want to thank you for giving us this opportunity that we get to come and worship you freely, Father, that we haven't uh, yet had the government tell us that we can't worship you like there are, like it is in some other places. Father, we thank you for this chance that we get to come and uh, open your word. Father, thank you for giving us your word so we can know more about you and more about Jesus Christ, our personal Savior, Father. Father, I ask you if there's anyone here today that doesn't know 100% certainty that they're on their way to heaven, that they get that knowledge, they get that right today, Father, they get that figured out. Because we don't want anyone leaving here without uh, 100% uh, Bible reason, uh, certainty, Father, that they are on their way to heaven. Father, we thank you uh, for this time that we get to worship you. We ask you to uh, bless our pastor, fill him with the Holy Spirit this morning. Give him the words that we need to hear, Father. Not what he wants to say, and not what we want to hear, Father, but what you want us to hear. Father, we thank you uh, for all that you do. Thank you for sending your son to die on the cross for us. Father, we ask you to bless this offering. We ask you to use it for your work and will, Father, that souls might be saved and lives might be changed, Father. Father, we love you and we thank you. And we ask you all these things in the precious name of Jesus Christ. Amen. What do you say to someone who feels like they've lost it all? Over the edge with no one there to break their fall. And what do you say to someone who feels so unloved? Giving themselves away a little bit every day just to be good enough. And what do you say to a hopeless soul? can't remember their way home and everything is out of their control there is no valley there is no darkness there is no sorrow greater than the grace of jesus there is no moment there is no distance there is no heartbreak he can't take you through so before you think that you're too lost to save remember there is nothing greater than grace what do you say to someone life is on the line and they're unsure what happens after their last breath in time and what do you say to someone who's built a wall you can't break through and it's so hard 
for them to hear the truth. There is no valley, there is no darkness, there is no sorrow greater than the grace of Jesus. There is no moment, there is no distance, there is no heartbreak he can take you through. So before you think that you're too lost to save, remember there is nothing greater than grace. So don't lose hope, don't let go. Jesus. There is no moment. There is no distance. There is no heartbreak. He can take you through. So before you think that you're too lost to save. So before you think that you're too lost to save. Remember, there is nothing greater than grace. I'll tell you, people doing. Do double and triple duty. That's not my notes. That's my notes. If you will, please turn to Genesis chapter number one. Genesis tap, chapter number one. I'll give you two or three minutes to find it. That is tongue in cheek, you know. Genesis chapter number one. We've been we've started and embarked on a study through the book of Genesis uh, at the beginning of the year, and we're on the third Sunday, and we're uh, looking at the first day of the week, or the first day uh, of creation. And I'd like to read verses 1 through 5 uh, with you this morning. If you're able, I ask you to please stand. Uh, we'll read verses 1 through 5. We'll have prayer, and then you may be seated. Uh, notice in Genesis chapter 1, verse number 1, it says, In the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. And the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. And God said, Let there be light. There was light. And God saw the light, that it was good. And God divided the light from the darkness. And God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And the evening and the morning were the first day. Father, we ask your blessings this morning upon the preaching of the Word of God. Lord, this is the foundational uh, 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 message. This is the foundation of... Uh, Lord, of our Christian faith, to believe, uh, number one, that there is a God in heaven, uh, to believe that, Lord, not only are you there, but that you created uh, the heaven and the earth, and, Lord, that you placed uh, uh, on the earth, Lord, the, the life that we uh, experience today, uh, Lord, from uh, the creation of, ev of all things out of nothing. Lord, I just pray that you'd help us today to see the truth in the Word of God, and, Lord, that we would... Uh, uh, Lord, accept, Lord, uh, by faith, uh, Lord, what you've done for us. Father, we just thank you again for Je in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. And you may be seated. Uh, this morning, I'd like to speak to you on the subject, uh, the day of the Lord. The day of the Lord. Now, uh, we've talked about some of the theories that are, uh, that are prevalent out there about creation. We talked about the, uh, the Big Bang Theory that there was a big explosion and that, out that from that explosion uh, everything came into perfect order. Now, I mean, that doesn't happen. I mean, you, uh, you know it doesn't happen. You've seen explosions, even if it's just been on TV, uh, you've seen explosions. You saw the, uh, if you were alive in 20, 
uh, 2001 uh, when you saw the planes fly into uh, World Trade Centers. And by the way, uh, what we saw on TV, we've been told now that that didn't happen. That it wasn't planes that flew into those, to those buildings. I read that the other day and I'm going. So what happened was that the media got together with Hollywood and deceived us. My grandmother lived to be a hundred and uh, a hundred, just almost a hundred and one, and um, you know, she never believed that anyone landed on the moon. She said that was an impossibility, and she believed that all of that done, Buzz Aldrin and you know, that all that was done in Hollywood in the movie theater uh, and the creation of that to make us believe and to deceive us that uh, somebody landed on the moon. And, I mean, she went to her grave believing that. She does not believe in all this stuff. And, I mean, she was not a technological person. She didn't want anything to do with technology. In fact, uh, the only reason there was a phone in her house was because uh, my aunt and uncle moved on the property to help take care of my granddad and my grandmother. And uh, uh, they put an extension in their house in case somebody called them. <laughs> and they would have to, you know, miss the phone call. That was, of course, back before cell phones and all of that. So my grandmother would talk on the phone. But she did not have it put in. Uh, in fact, she was so much against uh, uh, air conditioner. She said she couldn't breathe and all that. And they all put a window unit in her living room. And she told them not to do it. Now, she's a four foot, uh, 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 probably four foot 11, if, if that. And she told them, she said, you better not put that in there. My dad, electrician, he ran electricity for it. And my aunt, my uncles got together and they got bought it and they put it in. And she told him, said, it's not going to be in that window when you come back next time. It's going to be on the ground. Oh, no. And they didn't think she could get it out. Next time they came, it was on the ground. So I can't breathe with that thing in the window. I just rather have the window open. I mean, that's just the way my grandmother was. Now, for the media to think that the World Trade Centers were not destroyed by Muslim terrier, terrorists and that the planes did not fly it is ridiculous. But you know there's going to be somebody that believes that. Because people would rather believe the lie than the truth. Now, I'll tell you, explosions do not bring order. They bring chaos. And so we've talked about the Big Bang Theory. We've talked about the, um, the idea that, uh, of these generations between Genesis 1-1 and Genesis 1-2, uh, uh, where there's this long period of time and that God had created the heavens and the earth and that uh, Satan rebelled against God and God threw him into, into, um, into the earth and that came a time of great chaos and a great uh, uh, destruction and, uh, and, all. and then uh, that gave us the ice age and the dinosaurs and all that kind of stuff and then God recreated uh, you know, on day one. Well, today we're going to talk about another theory and I mentioned it uh, last week. It's called the day age theory the day age theory now as we read verses 4 and 5 we find that God uh, created or said let there be light okay now light is not a creative thing with God God is light you understand that we'll talk about that in just a moment but God said let there be light and so light was shown now you need to understand something darkness is not the absence or light is not the absence of let me try to word this around Darkness is not the absence of light, or is the absence of light. Let me put it that way. Darkness is the absence of light. Okay, so uh, wherever you see light, you can say, oh, there's a light over there. Uh, it was interesting uh, when I was in Tennessee this summer, uh, sitting up there on the, on the mountains and uh, uh, looking out, it would be pitch black dark around where I was at. I mean, there was absolutely nothing out there uh, up on that mountain. And, uh, but you could look out across the mountains, uh, and I mean, I don't know how far uh, it would possibly be, but you could see a night light or one of those uh, mercury vapor lights in the distance. You know, I mean, that's, that's all you could see. All right. Now, it was dark where I was at, but I could see a light. In fact, I'm told that if you take a, uh, if you get out here on Interstate 10, and you can see for 10 miles, which shouldn't be very difficult, except for the overpasses, 
so you have to stand on top of an overpass. Uh, but if you uh, look for, uh, and there was a candle uh, 10 miles down, you'd be able to see that candle with the human eye. So even though it's pitch black dark, you can still see a light. All right. And so God said, let there be light. Well, the light came into the world. In fact, if you take your Bibles and you turn to John chapter number 1, John chapter number 1, uh, John records uh, almost identical uh, in wording by the Holy Spirit of God uh, the creation and who was there in creation. In John chapter number 1, let's notice what we read. In the beginning, God, uh, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Now, I want you to, to stop for just a moment, and let's look at that verse again. Look at it in print. In the beginning was the Word. Now, I know Brother Roy posted on there about me being a grammar teacher and how much he hates me uh, for being a grammar teacher and always, you know, asking him to name me two pronouns and who, me? You know, that's Brother Roy's, you know, dementia. Anyway, I didn't say demented. <laughs> I said dementia. There's a difference. Okay. Now, notice the word the there. It's a determiner. And that determiner says that this is something that we need to take notice of the word okay now when we talk about when we say the we can say the chair okay specific right the chair or I can say the chairs okay specifically well that determiner says it's a, a specific okay notice the next word it says word okay now if I said the word that you want to know is then word I'm just referring to it as a word okay but this word has a has a special character a special denotation and it is capitalized which makes it a proper noun brother Roy okay if you're if you need any help brother Jason can help you a little bit you know he's not real up on his grammar but he could probably help you just a little bit Okay, now, so we have, a, we have a specific word. Okay, that word is capitalized, making it a personal noun or a proper noun. And that proper noun is Jesus. Okay, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. Okay, the same was in the beginning with God. Okay. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. The same care came to bear, uh, for a witness to bear witness of the light. Here again, we have the determiner, sp a specific light, proper noun, capitalized, the light that all men through him might believe he was not that light speaking of Jesus which lighteth every man that cometh into the world he was in the world and the world was made by him and the world knew him not he came into his own and his own received him not but as many as received him to them gave he the power to become the sons of God even to them that believe in or on his name now, notice that. He's used two proper nouns referring to the Lord Jesus Christ. First, he says he's the Word. Notice in our text, he said, And God said, Let there be light. Right? Okay, so we have light and Word. Both used in John chapter 1, referring to the Lord Jesus Christ. He's the light of the world. He is the Word of God. All right? Uh, so what significance does that have for us? Well, when we go back to Genesis chapter number 1, and we look at these verses, uh, notice that what he says in verse number 4. Uh, I'm sorry, verse number 3. And God said, let there be light, and there was light. And God saw the light, that it was good, and God divided the light from the darkness. And God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. Okay? And so, God separated dispersion 
Now, the word divided there means to put in two parts. Correct? Okay, if I take this, these, this section here and this section here, they are divided. Okay, if I wanted to bring them together, I could push all the chairs together and we would not have a center aisle. Okay, but now they're divided. Okay, and so the, the, the word that's divided there simply is the same thing. We understand what divide means. It, it's, it's a separation. Okay, and so God separated the light from the darkness. And not only did he separate the light from the darkness, but in the next verses, he, he divided not only that, but he, he divided the firmament, the water, and the, the, the water from the earth, and he made an, gave us an atmosphere. And not only did he give us an atmosphere, but he gave us a land. And then he gathered the waters on the earth and made dry land and seas. And we'll talk about that next week. And I want to show you a picture uh, next week. So you can look forward to a picture next week uh, on the screen to see a, something that's kind of very interesting uh, that maybe you would like to know and maybe haven't liked to, 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 wouldn't like to know. I guess that's up to you if you show up or not, okay? Now then, so he divided the light from the darkness. There's two areas here that we, we want to look at. First of all, in darkness, as I said, is the absence of light. When we look at it from that standpoint, we, we go into night. Now, right now, we, because of our distance from the sun and because of uh, being in supposedly winter. I think our winter was from January the 9th to January the 12th. Uh, but, uh, uh, you know, <laughs> that's our winter. Of course, February hadn't come yet, so we don't know. But that's our winter. In fact, there's shirts out there. I survived the uh, uh, Texas winter, <laughs> January 9th through January 12th. Uh, you know, big joke. But honestly and truthfully, I mean, we're in the winter. So what happens in the wintertime? We have the shorter days, Right? We're in the winter solstice, and that means that we are further away from the sun, and so we have more darkness. It starts getting darker earlier, and it you know, stays dark longer right now. Now we're beginning to see a transition, and the days are getting a little bit longer, a little bit longer, and a little bit longer, okay? Because we're now moving into that spring, and then into that glorious time of year, our our spummer, you know, let's bring summer together. And uh, so we have spummer uh, here in southeast Texas. Now in southeast Texas, it's, the days are going to get longer, so we're going to have more light and less darkness. But as long as there's light, we're going to have light, right? Now, one thing I enjoy doing at night is, uh, is taking the dogs out uh, for their last time before we, before we go to bed, usually between 10 and 10.30. And I stand out on the patio to make sure that they do their business so that they don't do it in the house. And I stand up there and I look at the stars and I just sit there and watch the stars. It's amazing. You can actually see stars out here. God's creation. And even in darkness, there's light. Even in darkness, there is light. Because God has given us the light of the sun to reflect off the stars to reflect off the moon so that we can have, in fact, the last few days has been a, pretty much of a full moon, right? Have y'all enjoyed that? The other night, uh, Nan said, did you see that full moon? It was absolute. Did you take pictures of it, brother? Chad, no, you didn't take pictures of it. Now I'm disappointed. Because <laughs> uh, I didn't go out to see it, okay? And I, uh, but anyway, she said it was an absolutely gorgeous moon, Okay? What is the moon? It's, it's a moon it's a or, that orbits around us, but the reflection from the moon shines on the earth and give it for nighttime. All right, so there's the, the one of the, of the lighting at night, but also, if you take your Bibles and go back to John chapter number 3, there's that other, and we talked about in John chapter 1, that men love darkness rather than light. Okay? Okay. Uh, the light came into the world, and the world knew him not. Okay, but let's look at John chapter number 3. Let's pick up in verse number uh, 16. Uh, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. 
For God sent not his, in, his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might believe, be saved. He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already, because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And this is the condemnation, that light is come into the world, and men love darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. For every one that doeth evil hateth the light, neither cometh to the light, lest his deeds should be reproved. But he that doeth truth cometh to the light, that his deeds may be made manifest, that they are wrought in God. Now here we see the picture of, uh, of, of the contrast between light and darkness. Jesus is the light. He, he came into the world to light the world, to illumine the world in a knowledge of, uh, of, of his presence. We sang the song, I Love to Tell the Story. And in that song, it sounds almost Christmassy because the angels sang and welcomed his birth. But there was a, a, a grand uh, announcement of the birth of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, uh, uh, from the angels as Jesus was born in Bethlehem's manger uh, that light had come into the world. But men love darkness rather than light. Why? Because their deeds are evil. Have you ever realized, and it, it, it's kind of almost beginning to, uh, to change now, but most crimes are committed at night under the cover of darkness? Why is that? Because when you have the darkness and you dress in dark clothing, you're hid. And so you can, you can do that in the darkness and, and not be recognized or not be uh, maybe seen as part of, of the crime that you've committed. Now, people are committing <laughs> crimes right in broad daylight now, but a, as, a, as a whole, it's mostly done at night. On the same, on the same page, men who, uh, and women who are alcoholics, when they go to the beer joint, regardless of it's, if it's noon or if it's uh, uh, 10 o'clock at night, the inside of that uh, beer joint, that honky tonk, that uh, that uh, den of uh, uh, of deception and and, and cruelty and uh, and wickedness, everything's dark. The lighting is very low. Don't you hate going into a restaurant at dusk uh, in the evening time and uh, and uh, you, you you open up the menu and it's bright and you can just see it and all of a sudden the lights go. They call it mood lighting. Atmosphere. I call it pain on old people. <laughs> because first of all, you've got to have the bifocals to be able to read the menu. You've got to have light to be able to read. And so what do you do? You have to get your phones out now and turn your flashlight on to see the menu. You know, They do that for, for effect. Okay, because they... Especially people there that you know that are there for a romantic evening. You know, that's great. I'm not there for romantic evenings now, so I don't have to worry about it. But they turn the lights down. Why? Because they set the mood. Beer joints, honky tonks, uh, uh, the dens of, of, of wickedness. Uh, they do everything in the dark. Why is that? Because men go in there and dance and and and, and carouse with other women, other men's wives right? Well, you don't want the world to see that you're not with your wife, that you're kissing on and, and dancing close next to a, a woman that's not your wife or your husband. So they, the, the, the wickedness is done in the darkness. They don't, they, they don't turn the bright lights up and say, hey, folks, you're, I mean, you'll never see a bright light in a beer joint. In fact, if you drive down Garth uh, Main Street, just past the Cedar by Lynchburg, on the right-hand side, they have one of those dens of iquity uh, right there. And the, and the doors sometimes are open. Uh, and even in the daylight, when it's open, you can look in there and it's dark. Why? Because it's a wicked place. You don't need to be there. You don't need to go. And you say, well, Brother William, how do you know about that? Because my daddy used to take me and set me on the... Uh, on the bar stool next to him and, and threatened me within an inch of my life if I told his, my mama that we went to the beer joint. 
because mama would send me with him thinking if he, if he has one of the kids with him he won't take them to the beer joint well, that didn't work out so well they're nasty they stink there's I mean there's there's nothing good in there and that's from a child's standpoint I don't think I've been in one uh, since I got saved and that was six, when I was 16 and I have no desire to be in a beer joint you should have no desire to be in a beer joint now why is that it's because our deeds are evil the the druggies they don't do their drugs in the broad daylight they go into hiding they go into a place uh, if they're partying they go into a, a dark place why is that well Jesus gives it to us right here their deeds are evil and there's an interesting statement notice if you will verse number 20 he says, For everyone that doeth evil hateth the light, neither cometh to the light, lest his deeds should be reproved. Do you understand why men hate Jesus? Here's a contrast here. Why do men hate Jesus? Why do men uh, want to do away with the Word of God? Why do men want to, uh, to do away with uh, uh, anything that is wholesome and, and, and godly and, and, and right? It's because their deeds are evil. They have no desire to come to the light. They don't, they don't want to come to uh, Christ, and so they would rather push him away and not come to the truth. When you bring the truth to somebody's door, it's happened to me on numerous occasions. I've gotten cussed out. I've been threatened to be killed if I didn't get off the property. I mean, I've had, uh, uh, I've had numerous things happen to me. Just knocking on doors, you say, well, that's fearful. Well, usually the devil throws one of those in there so that you'll get discouraged and you won't go back. That's usually what happens. You, you need to learn that principle. But honestly and truthfully, when you go there, the, the, the more wicked they are, the less they want you there. And they'll threaten you to get rid of you. But if you keep going back and you keep praying, I guarantee you they'll soften up. Now, the truth is, men love darkness rather than light. Now then, let's come to the other part of this and the closing of verse number 5 in Genesis. There's my Bible here. Genesis chapter number 1. Notice what he says. And God called the light day and the darkness he called night. And the evening and the morning were the first day. Now, if you read through Genesis chapter uh, number 1 and into chapter number 2, you will find that God divides everything by the evening and the morning being the first day, the evening and the morning the second day, the evening and the morning the third day. Right? This is the only place in the Bible that is attacked as being a literal 24-hour period of time. Only place. And I mean, I mean, it says evening and morning the first day. Evening, the morning. I mean, it qualifies. It gives us a, a period of time that says this is a period of time. What happens? Sun comes up, sun sets. Sun comes up, sun sets. Right? You see that every day. Well, some of you see it every day. Most of you see it setting, but you never see it come up. I think some people are would be shocked if they ever had to get up at, you know, 5 o'clock in the morning and realize that the sun's not there, and then all of a sudden it's there. It comes up in the east, and it sets in the west every day. It is so uh, so timed that the... the uh, meteorologists and the uh, the weather geniuses can tell you to the pinpoint of what time it will come up and what time it will set it's so accurate and so God placed it as a literal 24 hour period of time now the reason that those who like to discount the creation of God they make it a period of years and there's two verses in the Bible. One is uh, Psalm 90, verse number 4, where it says, uh, One day with the Lord is a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. And Second Peter chapter 3, verse 8, 
uh, uh, that says the same thing. And so they say, well, see, uh, uh, one day could be a thousand years. Well, let's stop and think about that. Do you know the difference between infinite and infinite and non-infinite? <laughs> What's the other word? Of stuff? Huh? Finite. Good. I, I knew. I knew that uh, brother uh, Jason knew that. Uh, brother Kurt was just uh, copying him. Okay. There, there's there's infinite and there's finite. You know the difference, right? Okay. Infinite means there's no beginning. There's no end. That's God. Correct. Finite are the two of us. Or all of us in the room. I'm finite. I was born on June the 10th, by the way. Mark that on your calendar. I was born on, on June the 10th at 10.32 in the morning. So if you call me at 10.30 and say happy birthday, I'm going to tell you it's not my birthday. My birthday is at 10.32 in the morning, okay? Now then, on June the 10th, 10.32 in the morning, I was born into this world, okay? And right now, I'm in existence. I haven't died yet. This message may have died, but I haven't died yet, okay? Now, so we have a, I'm finite. I have a beginning. One of these days, I'll have an end. Physically. Okay? God is not tied to time and space. Okay? He's infinite out there. And so in order to, for us to have order, for us to be able to function, he gives us, us a 24 hour period of time and he gives us seven days per week and so we have the same 24 hour period of time every day 365 days a year correct okay so we have 365 days of 24 hour days that determines us that that helps us as human beings as finite beings to be able to be organized to help us to be to live in a in a uh, in a area in a place where everything is done decently and in order, we have a time to awaken, we have a time to uh, to eat, we have time to sleep, we have time to work. I mean, all of that is defined in that twenty-four hour period of time, and God did that so that we would be organized and that we would be complete. And that we would be because see, God does everything decently and in order. He does nothing in chaos. Chaos comes from the devil, the wicked one. Okay, in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter number 14, it says that God does everything decently and in order. It's speaking of the church itself, but everything that God does is decent and in order. Can you imagine if the sun came up at uh, 10 o'clock tomorrow and 4 o'clock the next day and, I mean... We'd be so confused, we'd be like a, a, a termite and a yo-yo because we would never know when it was going to be light, when it was going to be dark. I mean, I don't think I could live in Alaska where it's six months of darkness. I might could handle, the, well, that would be just depression to me. But then there's six months of, of, of light. There's no darkness. And, and that would be confusing to me. I, I don't know how people do that because I... You know, and people tell this, then they go, oh, well, it's so great because you can, you know, at, at midnight, two or three o'clock in the morning, you can go out and you can, you can uh, uh, go skiing and you can go, I'm going, yeah, I don't ski. I don't do cold. I don't do, <laughs> I, I'm not interested in that. Okay, now then, I, I would be confused. And God doesn't want us to be confused. He wants us to, be, to, to have a time schedule. And so when God created the world, he put it in a time schedule. Now, the deniers of the word of God say, wait, 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 wait a minute. You know, that could be a thousand years. You don't know. I think if it was a thousand years, God would have said it was a thousand years. Now, in understanding this, that, that, that days mean different things in the Bible. Okay, and let me give you some, some examples of this. Now, we're talking about uh, a literal 24-hour period of time, but when is it not a 24-hour period of time? And does the Bible tell us it's not a 24-hour period of time? Well, let's just stay in the book of Genesis and turn to chapter 3, verse 5. Notice what it says in, in chapter 3, verse 5. For God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be open. And ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. 
the day that you eat thereof. Okay, what day is that? Is it a Monday, a Tuesday, a Wednesday, a Thursday, a Friday? Is it today? Is it tomorrow? We don't know. And so we cannot say this is a 24-hour period of time. But in the day that you eat of it, you will become as gods, knowing good and evil. So at any future time in the future, so that's not a specific 24-hour period of time, correct? But it still uses the word day, correct? Okay, let's come down a little bit further. Notice, if you will, verse number 8 in the same chapter. And they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord. Uh, uh, wrong verse. Where did I do? I put eight down there, but that's not. Um, it's down here somewhere. I know what's in there. They heard the voice of God walking in the car garden in the cool of the day. There it is. Okay, I just miss, missed it there. Okay, in the cool of the day. Okay, so in the cool of the day. Now, what was the cool of the day? Well, in our, <laughs> here in Southeast Texas, the cool of the day is usually in the morning, you know, or late at night. But we would probably say early morning in the cool of the day. But it's not a literal 24-hour period of time. Okay, uh, come down again uh, and, and notice that verse number 15. I will put enmity between thee and the woman, between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. Uh, again, I messed up somewhere in there. Oh, um. I know, let's see. Verse 15. Verse 14, let's see. And God said, Let the, said unto the serpent, Because thou hast done this thing, thou art cursed above all cattle and above all the, every beast of the field. Upon thy belly shalt thou go all the days of thy life. Uh, and, um, yeah. Uh, belly shalt thou go, and dust shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. Okay? Is that a 24-hour period of time? Or is it his complete lifetime? Until he expires. Okay? And so we can see... It's, it, when God says it's a 24-hour period of time, it's a 24-hour period of time. Unless it designates a different time period. Okay? We can say in seven days this is going to happen. So we know in, several, in seven 24-hour literal period of time will be Sunday. Or Saturday. Okay? And so we, we know. It's, we, we can calculate that. If we say as in the days of Noah, what are we talking about? We're talking about back in Noah's historical time period. And so if the Bible is talking about a specific 24-hour period of time, he will explain it as a 24-hour period of time, not as in a thousand years being one day. You do realize you can make the Bible say anything you want it to say if you twist it around enough. I've said this before, but... You know, the Bible says that uh, uh, Judas went out and hanged himself. The Bible says, go and do thou likewise. And the Bible says, what thou doest, do quickly. Now, if you take all of those verses out of context, and those are literal verses and literal uh, pieces of verses, you could justify suicide. But that's not what those verses mean. And you have to take them within the context of it. And that's what we have to do in Genesis. We have to take the context of what God is saying in Genesis chapter number 1 and chapter number 2 and understand that a evening and the morning are the first day, second day, third day, fourth day, fifth day, sixth day, seventh day. Why? Because it is a literal 24-hour period of time. You cannot put thousands of years between one and the other. But the pundits say, and those that are, uh, that are, are fighting the word of God say, well, you know, uh, when God did this, it, took, it, it would have to take a long period of time for this to evolve over, see, the word evolve there. And these would have to go into maturity. And these would have to go, no, God created what he wanted to create in that literal day, 
the way it needed to be. Everybody always asks the question, which came first, the chicken or the egg? The chicken. Simple. If you believe in God's creation. God didn't create the egg and let it hatch and then say, well, here's a chicken. The chicken came first. Which came first? An agnostic's brain or the agnostic? <laughs> the agnostic. And he had to learn to be an agnostic in his brain. You see, if we're, if we're going to study Genesis and we're going to study the foundation, what we need to understand is we take God literally at his word. Don't try to read into something that's not there. Don't read it that's not there. And I mean, studying through my, through my bachelor's program, through my master's program, and into my doctorate, there's people that they want to add things that aren't there. And you can't add to it. If the word of God doesn't say it, and it doesn't, uh, there's a, a law of called, uh, uh, I just forgot the law. For the law first mentioned. If it says it over here, it's going to say it somewhere else in the Bible. Not just maybe one or two times, but it'll, say, it, it'll be cohesive all the way through. Okay? And so we need to understand, if we compare Bible with Bible, not commentator with commentator. Because the best commentation or commentator on the Bible is the Bible itself. And if you read it and you study it, you'll find that the Bible works together. You don't have to try to invent some uh, harebrained idea uh, to come up with your viewpoint and make the Bible state what you want it to state. That's changing the Word of God, and there's a curse in the Bible for those who will add to the Word of God and for those who will take away from the Word of God. Deuteronomy gives you the warning, and Revelation, the last chapter, gives you that same warning. So rather than trying to invent some new thing and trying to come up with some new idea or try to justify why you do something or why you don't do something from the Word of God, and you to start twisting Scripture to find it out, just be, under, uh, be aware that God doesn't like that. He wants it to be. It's His Word. It's a perfect Word. Psalm uh, 12, 6, and 7. It's a pure word. And so when we look at the word, pure word of God, let's just take it in the context that it's given to us and compare it with, with other verses in the Bible, and I'll guarantee you we'll come out with the, right, with the right truth, with the Holy Spirit helping us. Let's stand for prayer. Father, we thank you today for your blessings. We thank you for your truths. And Lord, I just pray, Lord, I maybe... Uh, to mention some things, Lord, in the Word of God that as we go through, this, especially these uh, first few chapters here, uh, to realize, Lord, that uh, you gave us the Bible to be a literal book. And if you want us to use it figuratively, you tell us it's figurative. Lord, if you want it to be symbolism, Lord, you explain to us the symbolism. And Lord, if it's just statement, good old narrative, uh, Lord, it's, it's exactly what it is that you said. And Father, I pray that you'd help us to accept that uh, in our own hearts and our own lives. Father, if there's somebody here today that does not know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior of their life, Lord, I pray that they'd come to know him today. Of course, in the precious name of Jesus, we pray. With our heads bowed, our eyes closed, God spoke to your heart this morning some way.